In this lesson, we are looking at sex-linked inheritance and pedigrees, and we are specifically at this bit here. Okay. So let's travel back in time to where we learned about meiosis and the formation of gametes. We know that each gamete will contain one of each of the homologous pairs of chromosomes, including one sex chromosome. So in humans, we're talking X and Y. Since biological females only have X chromosomes, two of them, we can assume that the ovum is carrying uh, an X as its sex chromosome. But since biological males carry both uh, an X and a Y chromosome, 50% of the sperm will be carrying an X and the other half will be carrying a Y. And when fusion occurs at fertilization, the gametes on these, uh, sorry, the genes on these sex chromosomes will be inherited by the new offspring. So while all the homologous pairs of chromosomes actually have a matching gene sequence on them, even though they're of different varieties, the X and the Y are unique. They don't really match one another. So when a biological male inherits one of a sex, you know, one of these sex chromosomes, they'll only have one copy of the X there. So only one copy of the gene on each of these chromosomes. So as opposed to say a biological female, um, they're gonna get two copies of the X chromosome and therefore two copies of each gene on those chromosomes. So, you know, we, we refer to these as homogametic or heterogametic or hemizygous, you might also say. Um, but keep in mind throughout this uh, particular lesson, we are only really talking about XY males and XX females, remembering that there are many other combinations of sex chromosomes. So phenotypes that are inherited through genes on sex chromosomes are known as sex linked. And because of the combinations of sex chromosomes between biological males and females, we see that sex-linked inheritance disorders appear in different frequencies in males and females. The X chromosome has between 800 and 900 protein coding genes on it, as opposed to the Y chromosome with only 72. So there's not really much there. So because it's usually a gene on the X chromosome that's causing a sex-linked inheritance disorder, they're often referred to as X-linked. In humans, X-linked recessive traits, this is, we're talking specifically recessive traits, they're mainly expressed in biological males. They're rarely expressed in XX females, um, mainly because, you know, we've only got one to choose from. So if something's gone wrong with it, this is the only set of genes they have to work with. In females with two Xs, if they have one, one allele that maybe is mutated or something has gone wrong with it, they have another one to fall back on. If both alleles in the female happen to be recessive, then the recessive phenotype is going to be observed in this individual, but this is actually pretty rare. Now, because of this situation, females having the two X chromosomes and being able to transcribe another set, biological females can actually be carriers of the disease or the trait. So they don't express the recessive phenotype, but they can pass it on to their offsprings. Now, red-green color blindness is inherited in this way as is haemophilia, which is a disorder where the blood does not clot in the normal way. Now, in X-linked dominant inheritance, this is really rare, okay? But in this situation, females will always express the trait. Males will too, but only, um, they'll only pass on that trait to any future daughters as they only contribute the X chromosome to daughters, not their sons. Now, Y-linked inheritance is ridiculously rare and traits that are passed along in this manner pass from father to son, which makes sense because they're the only ones that are getting the Y chromosome handed down to them. Um, but again, they're pretty rare given the size of the Y chromosome and that most of the Y genes are related to sex determination and fertility. So we're going to have a little bit of an interlude about uh, pedigrees now. And a pedigree chart is a visual method of observing a trait passing through generations of a family. And once you observe enough generations and phenotypes, you can actually analyze the method of inheritance um, as this trait moves through the family. This is the easiest way to investigate inheritance modes in humans uh, because we can't just casually force a genetic cross. Also, we're pretty slow to come to sexual maturity and produce new generations. So this is the best way we can manage. Now, ped pedigrees use conventions in their symbols and their structures. We have standard symbols for males and females, those who are affected and unaffected by specific traits or disorders that were being you know, traced through the family. And we can see members of the family who have had offspring, what order in which they came in, um, what generation they came from, lots and lots of different things. We can see you know, um, carriers, once we know those kinds of things, we can see who's deceased, we can see um, you know, different kinds of twins, all that kind of thing. 
And we use these pedigrees to determine the mode of inheritance of a trait. And the modes of inheritance that we've already discussed are either autosomal or they're sex linked. And these traits can be passed in a dominant manner or a recessive manner. So our four main modes of inheritance are autosomal dominant or sex linked dominant, autosomal recessive or sex linked recessive. We'll spend a lot more time in class uh, having a look at these methods, but no, this is not explicitly mentioned in the syllabus document. It's just another tool in our um, in our cabinet, basically. So autosomal recessive inheritance is really evident when there's two parents with a phenotype that are different to their offspring. So if we have a look at these ones, we've got two carrier parents here, but then we've got um, a, an offspring there with what looks like the, dom uh, the recessive phenotype, sorry. Um, parents will be unaffected. They have the dominant phenotype, but the offspring will have the affected recessive phenotype. And this implies that both parents are carrying that recessive allele, making them both heterozygous for this gene. In autosomal dominant inheritance, you'll see something similar, but since the affected trait is the dominant a trait, uh, so the dominant trait this time, um, we'll see parents with, say, in this situation here, or even in this situation, to be honest, um, they have a recessive or a dominant there, and we will have dominant offspring as well. So it's still possible to have an unaffected offspring, and that implies that the parents have a heterozygous um, genotype there. Now, when a disorder is inherited in an X-linked recessive mode, we're talking color blindness or hemophilia, which we just mentioned, the trait is not dominant and will therefore more likely affect XY males in the family. Now, females can be carriers, but there's far fewer incidences of them being affected um, you know, with their phenotype uh, because they have that second X to rely on. So you will see female carriers. If a disorder is sex-linked dominant, this is going to affect more females than males, interestingly, because females are twice as likely to inherit an X, you know, an affected X chromosome there. Um, it's pretty rare, but if males are affected, they will always, because they're donating that X to their daughters, they will have affected daughters, and females will have sons affected, given they pass their own X onto their son as their only copy of the X chromosome there. So these are quite complex. And remember, um, you know, the syllabus isn't mentioning this explicitly, but it's an important tool for visualizing how different modes of transport, different modes of transport, different modes of inheritance run through families. Um, in particular, they highlight the sex differences uh, when, when inheritance is sex linked. So stick with it and we'll be practicing a lot more in class.